the United States, now living in the Netherlands. And Adrian is the co-creator and former co-BDFL, Benevolent uh, Dictator for Life, is that right? Uh, of the Django web framework. So all of you who uh, use Django probably know Adrian already. He was working as a developer at an American newspaper when the team decided to open source their homegrown collection of web development tools. These days, he's making SoundSlice a web-based music education tool. Originally from Chicago, he now lives in Amsterdam. And uh, one tidbit I, I just learned yesterday is that uh, Adrian is here at PyCon Slovakia. He will not be at, uh, at DjangoCon Europe, but he's here at PyCon Slovakia. I'll leave five seconds for you to have that sink in. Adrian, we're looking forward to hearing about the human human part of open source. Thanks, Jakujem. Dobry den. Ja iz Amerike, ali ja troška hovorju po ukrajinske. I'm from America, but my family's from Ukraine, so I grew up speaking Ukrainian. It's very nice to be in a place where I can sort of understand the local language, kind of. Uh, There were only two times in my life where I wanted something so badly that I got down on my knees and asked my wife. The first was when I proposed marriage, and uh, fortunately she said yes in 2001. And the second time was when I saw this article uh, several years ago. It was back in 2012. Uh, I'm an obsessive Beatles fan. And uh, if you know anything about the Beatles, you might have heard about uh, Abbey Road, which is the recording studio in London where they recorded nearly all of their music over around 10 years. And this is still a working recording studio to this day. So if you're just a, a lame little fan like me, you're never going to be able to go in there, uh, except this time. Uh, they actually opened up the studio to the public for one of the first times ever. Uh, and I saw this, and I was like, oh my god, I have to go there. I'll do whatever you want. I'll do cook meals, do the laundry, do whatever. Uh, I, I have to go there. And I got down on my knees, and I said, please, I'd love to go. I was living in America at the time, so this was uh, would require quite an expensive plane ride all the way to London and back, and then the lodging and then you had to pay to actually go to this, so it was a big deal. And we had a one-year-old baby at home, so it was a big ask. Uh, but fortunately, my wife said, sure. So I got to do this, to me, the very exciting adventure. I, you showed up, it was about uh, 100 people maybe, and uh, you arrived at Abbey Road Studios, and just looking, I was so happy. Uh, and from, from the very first moment, uh, I got this sense of the history and <clears throat> everything that happened there. In fact, this, this very staircase that goes to the studio was where the Beatles did one of their original publicity photos. Uh, you can see it's still the same uh, banister, it's the same staircase, the same everything. I was like, wow, it happened right here. Those, those guys were just standing right here. Uh, but the majority of this uh, event was happening inside the studio, specifically in studio number two, which is the room where the Beatles recorded most of their stuff. Uh, and we were allowed to just roam around and take in the atmosphere of that studio. Uh, and uh, there was also a lecture and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but I, as, as an obsessive fan, I, I as soon as I got in there, I, I just was overcome with this feeling of, wow, this is where it happened. Uh, that staircase I had seen in many, many photos. Here's a, a photo from the uh, mid-60s of the Beatles in basically the same position. So I was standing exactly where Ringo was standing 30-some uh, years, 40-some years ago. Uh, I, I was amazed by this. Uh, and. Uh, at one point during the lecture, they said, see those red chairs that you're standing on? You might be sitting, or not standing on, sitting on. Uh, you might be sitting in the chair that Paul McCartney sat in 
when you recorded the song yesterday. We didn't keep any formal records of which chairs were used, but they're the same chairs, so maybe you're sitting in Paul's chair from yesterday. I, absolutely astonishing to me. Wow, this is where that happened. And also incredibly astonishing to me was the display of the equipment that the Beatles used and, and other bands like Pink Floyd who recorded in this same space. This really old looking machine was what they used to alter the sound of the Beatles vocals to get their signature sound. And, and you look at that thing and it looks like something you wouldn't even spend five euros on if you saw it you know, in, in some old shop. It, that, that crappy little thing is what they used to make these, this beautiful music? And then these other machines like this uh, record cutting machine that would actually make demos for them uh, whenever they wanted to take something home. Of course, there were no uh, iPods or MP3s. They would literally have to carve a record and take it home so they can listen to it. And that's what they use? Oh my god. One of my favorite parts was the pianos. Uh, this one on the, the upper left was the used on the intro to Oh Blah Dee Blah Da Dum Da Da Dum Da Da Dum 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 and a lot of other tunes. Uh, and uh, these three pianos together we used at the end of this tune called A Day in the Life. Does anyone, is anyone a Beatles fan? Some, yeah, okay, excellent. So at the end of the song, A Day in a the Life, there's this big thunderous piano boom chord. And that was played on these three pianos. And during the presentation, they got three volunteers to uh, play the exact same notes. And if you look closely, you can see some green stickers. They told you where to put your fingers. They had three volunteers play the exact same notes on the exact same instruments in the exact same room where it was recorded in 1967. It was mind blowing. I, I, I just could not believe this. It, it sounded amazing. So after a few hours of this, they kicked us out. Uh, I would have loved to stay there for years. Uh, and of course, right in front of the studio is this crosswalk and if you don't know this that you may recognize it now if i show you the album cover of the beatles every road one of the most iconic album covers ever that's where it happened so as i was walking across that and reflecting on what i had just experienced i realized this was one of the most inspiring moments of my life this this concept of Beatles music had always seemed to me to be something just handed down from heaven. Uh, just something that appeared and it was beautiful and it was in the world. And I never even considered that these were just some normal people. They went, to, went into a physical space, used some kind of crappy looking equipment and made some music and then they went home. I, I never even considered, it's just a bunch of people. It's just a crosswalk. It's just normal human beings. So back when I started getting into the Beatles when I was a teenager, uh, I liked it so much that I wanted to learn how to play these songs, so I learned how to play guitar. And over the last 10 years since the beginning of YouTube, I started posting YouTube videos of, like many uh, musicians do, you just post your little silly little recordings of yourself playing. And over the 10 years, I've gotten uh, more and more people look at it and subscribe and whatever and post comments. And a few years after, uh, I, I, post, I posted one video. Uh, this, this was uh, a tune called Never My Love, which was, uh, according to Wikipedia, the second most recorded uh, song of the 20th century. And if you don't know it, it goes like this. Never mind, love. Never mind, love. Is that any bell? Some people? Okay. You should listen to music from the 60s, man. It's the best. So I recorded a cover of that tune. And a little while later, I received a message on the Facebook or uh, the, the YouTube message system. It was this it said, I am Richard Adrisi, one of the brothers who wrote that song. Remember, this, is, this isn't some uh, little stupid song. This is, the, according to Wikipedia, the second most uh, listened to song of the 20th century. 
I, was li- I, I saw your, your video on YouTube. My brother, who I, he wrote the song with, has passed away, but he would, he would have loved the chords that you used. Will you please send me an MP3 of this? And I, I'm, I'm looking at this, and I, my jaw is hitting the floor. I, how could you even... I, I couldn't even fathom that the, the writer of this song found, goes on YouTube? And Lynn looks for stuff and actually found my silly little video of it. I, I was astounded. I, I couldn't talk for 10 minutes or so. Uh, so I, I ended up responding to him and emailing him the MP3. And he responded and said, thanks. I'm going to put this uh, on a CD so I can listen to it in my car. What? <laughs> really? But then it, it hit me. It's that same thing. This is just a normal person. This is just a human being. Everything is just people. A little while later, I got this email. My name is Pilou. I am a professional magician from France. On December 31st, I will perform an act on a very famous TV program. I will use some of your music. Is that OK with you? Uh, I don't know anything about France. I don't know anything about magicians. I was like, sure, use, use the song. OK. I didn't think anything of it. Uh, in fact, I didn't even send him any MP3s, so he must have just ripped the, like, done a YouTube downloader and gotten the tunes from it. So a, a little while later, he emails me back and said, oh, thanks for letting me use your music. I thought you might want to see what, what ended up happening. OK, so he sends me a YouTube link, and this is a little excerpt from that. Plaisante, je crois, mais bien sûr, c'est un français. Plaisante, je crois, mais bien sûr, c'est un français. Regardez bien l'agilité de ce garçon. Il s'appelle Pi Cadre. This is my music play. And this is a magician. So it turns out this was uh, watched by several million people. It was the preeminent New Year's Eve TV show for all of France. And the magician was doing, number one, this magician, which is awesome, and number two, he somehow was using my music? I, I couldn't even believe this. But again, it's just people. He was just a guy who needed a tune, and uh, he happened to find something on uh, YouTube, and he used it. I, I, I still, to this day, am astounded. I, I think this is probably my proudest accomplishment. Uh, the favorite YouTube comment I ever received was this one. It said, my father and I listened to your music over and over again while he was sick and bedridden. Your music gave him such joy until he succumbed to cancer just a few weeks later. He always wanted to learn how to play guitar and enjoyed watching your guitar playing as he pretended to strum his own instrument on his stomach. Your music was the last sound he heard in his life. Ooh, I almost get choked up reading that. You put something on the internet, and you don't really think about the real people who will react to it. You think of it as this abstract thing where you're just sort of spitting things out onto this nebulous thing called the internet, and hopefully some people will see it. But it is just people when it comes down to it. Every, everyone who looks at your stuff, everyone who uses your code, uh, other people who post code, put things on the internet, are just people. Back in 2002, I moved to this uh, part of the US, a little tiny town called Lawrence, Kansas, with a population of less than 100,000 people. Uh, and I moved there to work for this newspaper website called ljworld.com. A very, as we say, a very small potatoes thing. The circulation, the number of people who read the newspaper was about 20,000. So very, very small. But for, for some reason, uh, the, the team was really, really good. The team of, on the newspaper side, the team on the, the website side. And we developed a bunch of tools that would help us build websites more quickly. And after a few years of doing that, we, we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we open sourced that for many reasons? Uh, because 
to give back to the community, uh, to let people uh, know about this newspaper, and maybe it would help with recruiting, uh, and for some other reasons as well. And so we decided to call it Django, and we open sourced it. And this is what the website looked like shortly after it was open sourced. We didn't really have many plans for this, uh, other than uh, hopefully letting some people know about our tiny little newspaper uh, for recruiting. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, on, on a very selfish, for a very selfish reason, it's something that I really liked using, and I knew that I wasn't always going to work at this tiny newspaper in Kansas for the rest of my life. So I thought, oh, well, if we open source it, that means I can use it for my own projects in the future. Uh, but we, we didn't have any huge plans, uh, but almost immediately, it's, uh, it started to catch on. And uh, the, the most, I remember in those early days, the first time that I, I sat, I, I jumped up and I said, whoa, was ticket number 65. Uh, somebody said, well, I'm, uh, let's see, I, I don't know where they were, but they, they wanted to translate the interface into Dutch and Russian and maybe Hebrew. And you, I don't know if you, if you know anything about the middle of America or Kansas, uh, but this is not the most international part of the world. Uh, so when we created this framework, we had, there was no internationalization. Uh, there was no expectation that anyone would, would need this. So to, to see this come in uh, just made us stand up and say, whoa, not only is this, uh, are people seeing it, people in, on the entire different part of the globe want to use it and want to use it in their own language? That's amazing. But then we, we sort of started realizing, yeah, it's just people. A few years later, it, the community started to grow and grow, and we got, uh, we, we decided we wanted to do a conference to uh, get some of these people together and meet other human beings in real life. Uh, so we had a Django Con. The first one was in 2008, and it was a big love fest. There was a lot of hugging. Uh, except me, I'm over there on the left, <laughs> avoiding the hugs. Uh, and uh, this was the first time that, that I met a lot of these people uh, around the US, and also some people flew in from around the world to uh, meet other Django users. And the, the thing that I'll never forget was when we were waiting in line to enter the, the event, uh, uh, a man came up to me and said, and he sp spoke very little English, uh, but it became clear he was from Japan, and he uses Django, and he, and he liked it, and, and he liked it so much that he wrote a book about it in Japanese, and I, I didn't even know what to say. Uh, I, I was flabbergasted that someone in Japan even knew about Django, let alone used it and loved it and wrote a book about it. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still flabbergasted that this happened, even though Django's been around for more than 10 years now. Uh, but really, it's just people. That guy is just a guy who, who found Django and, and, and started using it. Everything is just people. So why am I telling you all of this? Uh, there are many reasons to use open source. Uh, it's good for, well, it's good because it's free. Uh, it's good because, the, as they say, many eyes make bugs shallow. Uh, the more people who look at code, the better it is. I know that whenever I contribute to an op open source project, especially a high profile one like Django, I, I'm 1,000 times more careful than if I were com uh, committing something to my own work code because I know if I make any mistakes, uh, hundreds of people are going to immediately see it, and probably politely, but nonetheless, they will point out the mistake. Uh, so open source is high quality code. It's free. Uh, if you want to customize it, you can 
very easily customize it. There are many advantages to it. And this is all stuff that we know as, as Python developers and members of this community. But something ever since these experiences that I've just laid out for you, the, the Abbey Road uh, experience where I, I realized that's, that's just a bunch of people. Uh, all, all of my YouTube experiences, wow, that, the writer of that song is, is just a person. And this, uh, my experience is meeting Django users. Well, it, it's just a person. I'm just a person. The other contributors to Django are just people. Uh, it's really made me realize why I really love open source. It's not just those reasons that I mentioned. The, it's free and the code is good. But it more than any other type of software development, it, it underscores this, this common humanity. Uh, anything, anything that you might use that's not open source, such as Google, is sort of this abstract product. Uh, of course, you know somewhere deep inside that it's made by human beings, but that's, there's just no incentive for Google to tell you. That's, there, there's, you just don't think about it. You don't think about the developers who made Google. There are exceptions from time to time when they have product announcements that are written with a byline that, that, that has a person's name. But in general, it's just some big blob that you don't really think about the people behind it. But the thing about open source is, uh, due to the way that the whole system and culture and software works, everything is tied back to individual people. Every time a, a commit is made to any open source project that uses GitHub or any sort of public source code repository system, it is always tied back to one person who made the commit. And you can, uh, as you look at an open source project, you can sense that humanity. And, and more than anything else, that's what I love about it. Uh, and even the, in the big leagues, even Python itself, uh, which was made by Guido, uh, in, in, in the early 90s, and he still commits to it every so often, you can even see his efforts. And you can see he's just a human, too. Uh, and wow, he made that exact line of code change. I probably would have done it the same way, or I would have done it a little bit differently. Uh, but and regardless of what, what the details of the code are, you can get the sense that that's just a human being. And, and that, to me, is, is what makes me really, really excited about open source, is it's just a bunch of people. So how many of you have, uh, have contributed to open source projects? Code or documentation? OK, maybe half of you. Excellent. Uh, you probably don't need any inspiration. But the reason that I am, am telling you this is uh, hopefully to inspire you a little bit more to think about not just the face value uh, of your open source contributions, fixing problems for people, uh, making life a little bit better for developers, uh, but the humanity of it all. It's more than any other software development uh, enterprise. I think this, this is how you can connect with other people uh, the best. And how many of you have never contributed open source? Some, OK, maybe a, a fifth. Uh, I think it, this is one of the most, one of the best, most, most rich things you can do as a developer is, is get involved in an open source project. Uh, not only for the, the, uh, actually the excellent reasons that were pointed out in a talk this afternoon in the other room. If you didn't see it, I highly recommend watching the video, uh, why you should contribute to open source. Not only for all those reasons, like it'll maybe get you a better job, it'll make you a better developer, but because I think it makes you a better human, frankly. It, it, it helps you be aware of other people, and it helps you realize everything is just made by humans. Even the beautiful Beatles music, even the that, that song that, that you've heard on the radio 50 billion times, that was just people. And as I contribute to an open source project, I'm putting my little contribution into humanity. 
Ďakujem. Are there any questions? Wow. <laughs> I don't remember ever crying at a tech conference. And um, listening to you, um, you know, I lost it twice. <laughs> um, yes, there, there is a question. Looking back, would you imagine that some web framework would influence your life? OK, just disappeared. There you go. It's magic. Uh, would influence your life in such a way. Thank you for your work on Django. It changed my life. Yeah, I, I had no idea that it, it would become what it's become. Uh, I still, to this day, get excited whenever I meet someone who uses it. Uh, even though it's been more than 10 years, it still absolutely blows my mind that uh, people that I do not know use it. <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, I still consider it something that came out of that tiny little newspaper by a, a small little web development team. So uh, I didn't expect that to happen. And uh, I'm very grateful that people use it. The first thing that I say whenever someone says, thanks for Django's, Thanks for using it. Uh, thanks for finding it, yeah. Can you comment on uh, open source uh, maintainers burnout? Yeah, that's a big problem. But I, I think that it's being recognized more and more. I, that's something I've noticed over the last maybe one or two years. People are. Uh, instituting new policies to prevent burnout. Uh, one thing that we've tried in the Django community is to actually pay for features. Uh, we, we pay a person to do full-time work or part-time work on Django. Uh, Andrew Godwin has been paid to work on Django channels. This is something that has been a very controversial thing in the past. And for some reason, uh, it, for instance, if if 10 years ago you had said, hi, I maintain an open source project. If you want this feature, you're going to have to pay me. You would have been laughed at, or even people would have just said, uh, who are you? This is open source. We're all hippies. Why are you introducing money into the equation? Uh, but for some reason, I, possibly related to this, it's been a little bit more acceptable to, to introduce money uh, and I think part of that is because people realize that maintaining an open source project uh, is not sustainable for, for everybody uh, because it takes a lot of time. It also uh, chips away at your uh, sanity. Uh, if you're constantly, let's say you have an hour every day to work on open source stuff. Like I used to spend it was like a second job. I would spend four or five hours a day doing Django stuff, and that was separate from my day job. If you sit down, if I were to sit down and say, now is my Django time, uh, and so I pull up the bug tracker, and I just, I'm greeted with 200 problems. That's basically what the bug tracker tells you. It's problems. Some of them are feature requests, but that can be interpreted as a problem, too. Depends on if you're an optimist or a cynic. Uh, but you, you can only, that's only sustainable for so long. So I, I, I seem to think that, I seem to see that the tide is turning with regard to uh, open source burnout. And I think things like paying people and just having an, an overall sense of, yeah, this is work. It's not all fun and games. And therefore, there should be some money or some, something else attached to it. Uh, I think that's healthy. Why did you move to Amsterdam? Well, you may not know this, but Django was named after a musician called Django Reinhardt. Yeah? And I play that style, I try to play that style of music. It's uh, a bit uh, 
noty, as they say, lots of notes, fast and hard to play. And there's a great scene in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to be in a scene uh, of musicians of that style. Uh, also, my wife and I wanted to have a little adventure uh, before our kids started school. Uh, he was not yet in school, so we realized we had a, a year and a half before we start school and we become boring. So uh, yeah, we decided to have a little adventure. And Europe's the best, man, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and fortunately, with my, uh, my day job, I'm, I can work from anywhere. So that is the most important factor. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do that. Why is Django not called George then? Oh, for George Harrison, the Beatle. Uh, yeah, that's a, it's probably not a great name. Uh, there's a conference talk maybe at one of the Django cons from a few years ago about all the names that we considered. Uh, and there are a lot of really bad ones. My favorite, actually, for the record, was Tornado, because I think that's kind of cool sounding. But uh, Kansas, where we made Django, is actually has tornadoes, and it turns out they kill people, and they're not good things. So the, the native Kansan said, yeah, let's not have tornadoes, because it's like <laughs> calling something Ebola or something. Yeah, it's a bad name. <laughs> How can a non-programmer uh, spur or start an open source project? A good question. Maybe by documenting. If you know enough about programming to at least know what's possible and how and what an API is and how an API would work, maybe you could just document something uh, to say which problem you're trying to solve and what, what the, the API would be for a programmer to do that. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to start your own open source project if you're not a programmer. I would suggest contributing to another one. There are so many things you can do uh, without being a programmer, like uh, ticket triage. That's uh, basically just re requires organizational skills and a certain level of OCD. Just going through a ticket system on a medium to large project and finding duplicates and marking them as duplicates. You don't have to really know anything about programming to, in order to do that. And it's a hugely valuable for, for the team. And also writing documentation is the best thing uh, any non-programmer can do. That, oh, even, I think it's the best thing a programmer can do, too, writing documentation. And the last thing we have is not really a question. It's just a remark. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adrian. OK, exactly. <laughs>